Hi everyone, welcome back to the second lecture of week one. Now in this lecture, we are going to take a deeper look at different immune cells in both the innate and adaptive immune systems. We will also look at the major tissues and organs involved in the system as well. So let's get started. Again, here are the lecture objectives. We will review the cells related to the immune system, describe the functions of all these white blood cells, and review the tissues and organs in the immune system, and describe the functions of primary and secondary lymphoid tissues. So here is just a recap slide from the first lecture uh, to remind us that all of the cells, all of the blood cells, are derived from the process called hematopoiesis in the bone marrow. And the major focus of today's lecture is to look at white blood cells or leukocytes, including granulocytes, mast cells, monocytes, lymphocytes that are derived from this process. Now, other than these white cells, we also have erythrocytes and platelets. Uh, we will not discuss in immunology as for now. Um, so the immune system really is composed of all these different kinds of leukocytes. During the uh, hematopoiesis process, there will be three different lineage of blood cells. Uh, the first lineage is myeloid lineage, uh, including white blood cells of the innate response, uh, all these granulocytes, including neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and as well as monocytes. Uh, in terms of the lymphoid lineage, it will form adaptive response white blood cells our B cells and T cells, and also NK cells. Now, notice that NK cells is still considered as part of the innate response. And in terms of the erythroid lineage, we'll form wrapper cells and platelets. Let's begin our talk with the myeloid cell lineage. It will form something called common granulocyte precursors. They are common for all of the granulocytes, which is harder neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. It will also form a branch called mast cells. Now, notice that mast cells' main purpose is to release cytoplasmic granules and also kill microorganisms and induce inflammation. We'll talk more about mast cells in later slides. And it will form monocytes as well. Monocyte is more of an intermediate type of uh, uh, white blood cells because it will eventually form macrophages and dendritic cells. Let's look at neutrophil first. Now, they are the most abundant white blood cells. About 40 to 75 percent of the white cells are neutrophils. They're considered as granulocytes, meaning in this cytoplasm, they contain granules that are packed with lysosomes and phagosomes. Their main job is uh, to phagocytosis, to do phagocytosis and kill bacteria. Now, in their uh, life cycles, actually, they don't uh, live very long, okay, about uh, 10 hours or so after leaving the bone marrow. So they are not present in healthy tissues. They only rapidly migrate to damaged tissues. And in the process, they also secrete defenses and aid in the healing process of the infection site. So the process for neutrophils to migrate to the site of infection is called diapedesis. And also involved in that, there is something called chemotaxis. So what happens, usually there are some chemotactic source at the site of infection that attract neutrophils to slip out from the blood vessels to enter uh, the site of infections, oftentimes we're talking about site of uh, uh, injury. Now notice that uh, diapedesis is a very uh, interesting process. When, they, when the cells migrate through the capillary, the capillary walls are actually intact, okay, but with increased permeability. So the blood vessels are not broken in the process. So let's look at the second uh, granulocyte, which is eosinophil. About 1-6% to 6 of them are eosinophil, so not a whole lot, but their granules pack with um, inflammatory mediators and as well as reactive oxygen species. They don't do a whole lot of phagocytosis, but they do have some chemotaxis uh, ability, and their major function is involved in allergic reactions or uh, parasitic infestation. So they can release hydrolytic enzymes and reactive oxygen species that, uh, to kill the 
are invading parasites. Now, they are often found in connective tissues underneath the respiratory gut and urogenital urotol, uh, epitheliums. Now, notice why they are found in those places. Think about it. Right, so because those places are facing outside and it's oftentimes in touch with the outside invaders, such as parasites. The third type of granulocyte is basophils. They are the least abundant, about 1% of fiber cells, and in contrast to eosinophil that we just looked at, that they are found underneath some of the um, mucosal membranes, they are actually found primarily in the circulatory system. Uh, their granules release histamine, heparin, which are uh, powerful vasodilating agents and as well as anticoagulants. They can also release bradykinin and serotonin. So what do they do? They mostly involved in allergic reactions. So in allergy-associated antibodies, uh, like we call them IgE, when they bind with high affinity to basophils and mast cells, it will initiate all kinds of allergic reactions. Now we will talk about these allergic reactions or so-called hypersensitivity during the later half of the course. Now let's look at mast cells. Mast cells, perhaps you have heard of it uh, before, it's best known for involvement in allergic reactions. Uh, they are also considered as a type of granulocyte and they primarily release histamine. So it shares some type of a similarity with eosinophil and as well as basophil. So in terms of eosinophils, they are also active against parasite. Now in comparison to basophils, they also have high affinity site for allergic related antibodies or IgEs. So IgEs can bind to these mast cells and uh, help it to release histamine. However, there are also some differences. Now remember, basophils are primarily found in the circulation. Mast cells are present primarily in mucosal and connective tissues instead of the blood circulatory system. So remember that. The next cell type we're going to look at is dendritic cells. Now, it is described as a star-shaped morphology. So in microscope, under the microscope, it often looks like a star, okay? That's why I draw them like a star as well. Now, they are the major antigen-presenting cells, okay? And actually, it is the bridge between innate and adaptive uh, cells. So its job is to take up antigens by phagocytosis. So they eat up the uh, invading pathogens and process the antigens for recognition. So they would degrade the antigens and transport degraded or sometimes intact antigens to lymph node. And during that time in the lymph node, they're going to display, yes, antigen presenting. They're going to display the antigen or part of the antigen to T cells inside the lymph node. And in there, it will activate T cells and other leukocytes. When we talk about monocytes and macrophages, we oftentimes put them together because monocytes are actually immature macrophage. Now, it can do a little bit of both jobs uh, like a uh, dendritic cells as well as neutrophils uh, because they can do phagocytosis but they can also do antigen presenting. Now, however, they don't live very long, about less than 10 hours in circulation. So one of the characteristic or morphology of monocytes is a horseshoe-shaped nucleus. Now they can migrate and attach to various tissues, and after that, they're gonna differentiate into macrophages. Now macrophages are terminally differentiated tissue-associated monocytes, so they're job is to eat. Yes, they are highly phycocytic. Okay, they, their best job is to eat and they are also responsible for recognitions and presenting antigen as well. So here are some of the pictures and figures to show you what monocyte and macrophage look like. They do look quite different under the microscope. Now, the down there is a keynote for you to quickly recognize what's going on. Now, in the blood, they are considered a monocyte, and once they move to the tissues, they have a tissue adhesions, they become macrophages, and further down, macrophage can also be further activated uh, under inflammatory signals, become activated macrophage. 
So here are two figures that shows you the major functions of macrophages, which includes phagocytosis and cytokine release. Now, how do they do it? Now, on the left-hand side, when there is a binding of bacteria to phagocytic receptors or macrophages, it will induce their engulfment and degradation, so completing the process of phagocytosis. On the right-hand side, it shows you the event where uh, bacterial components bind to signaling receptors or macrophages, and it induces a synthesis of inflammatory cytokines. Now, more about these phagocytosis and cytokines release process in our next lecture. So we've just finished talking about all the uh, cells coming off from the myeloid lineage. Now let's look at the lymphoid lineage. Now it includes cells of the lymphocyte, which we call them B cells and T cells, which are part of the adaptive immune response, as well as NK cell. Well, that is part of the innate response. Let's have a quick look of NK cells. Now NK cells stand for natural killer cells. Again, they are part of the innate immune response. They are considered a type of cytotoxic lymphocyte because they are toxic to cells. Now, one of the difference or why they are considered as innate immune response is they are not very specific in contrast to adaptive immune response, which are very specific. So they have very limited ability to recognize cell and non-self. Now we're going to talk about some of these mechanisms again in the next lecture. Now in brief, NK cells are considered as the first line of innate defense against different viral infections. So it can also kill viral infected cells or tumor cells by secreting perforins, which can form pore in the cell membrane of the target cells. Granzymes, in, which can induce programmed cell death or apoptosis. It can also release interferon gamma, then in turn can induce T cell differentiations. We will talk about lymphocytes in much greater details in the second part of this lecture series. Right now, we're just going to have a snapshot. Now, in lymphocytes in combinations represent about 20 to 50 percent of the ripe cells. It can divide it into two major groups. The first group would be B lymphocytes or B cells. Why? Why we call it B? Because it is derived from bone marrow. Now they are responsible for humoral immunity, meaning that when they are activated, they can differentiate into antibody-producing plasma cells. The second group would be T lymphocytes. Now the T stands for thymus. They are thymus dependent. They're responsible for cell mediated immunity or cellular immunity. Now mostly what they do is to kill virally uh, infected cells. Now one way to tell between T cells and B cells is by looking at their membrane associated marker. For B lymphocytes, now it has to be related to uh, antibodies. Okay, so they express immunoglobulin molecules on their membranes. So uh, the technical term they are called membrane-bound immunoglobulins. Now you can see that immunoglobulins actually is a term that are interchangeable with the term antibody. In terms of the T lymphocytes, they express different type of receptors. They call T cell receptors. They can also be distinguished with different unique markers known as clusters of differentiations, such as CD3, CD4, CD8. Now, again, we're going to talk more about B cells and T cells during uh, the lectures when we uh, dive into the adaptive immunity. Another thing we need to uh, notice about the differences between B cells and T cells are their origins. Now, both B cells and T cells are produced from stem cells in the bone marrow, so they originated from the stem cells in the bone marrow. However, B cells they mature there. Okay, they mature in the bone marrow before they move into the circulations and other lymphatic tissues such as lymph nodes and spin, spleen. Now, in contrast to B cells that leave as a mature B cells, lymphocytes 
leave the bone marrow as a immature form. We call them uh, thymocyte, actually. Now, so after they leave the bone marrow, they will migrate to the thymus. And it is in the thymus, a small fraction of those thymocytes are further differentiated into mature team lymphocytes, which migrates from the lymphatic glands to the blood and lymphoid tissues. Now, one side note here is that thymus or the thymus gland actually shrinks or diminishes with aging. And this is also the reason why older people have a weaker T cell immune response. Here is a visual review or a summary of the origins of both B cells and T cells that we just talked about. So we begin at the top at, in the bone marrow uh, within the lymphoid stem cells, it will generate B cells and T cells. Now B cells, when they leave, they leave as a mature B cells and they can travel through the circulations and when go to uh, organs and secondary lymphoid organs where they can further mature activated into plasma cells that they can produce circulating antibodies. Now in contrast to the T cells, when they leave the bone marrow, they leave as an immature form, but they mature in the thymus where they can become either helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells. Now they can also further uh, circulate in the blood and enter secondary lymphoid organs where they uh, further multiply. So we've been talking about all the cells and we slowly migrate to talking about some of the lymphoid tissues and organs. So now let's look at these organs. Basically, when we look at lymphoid tissues, we can break down into two major categories primary lymphoid tissues and secondary lymphoid tissues. The primary lymphoid tissues we are referring to the bone marrow and thymus where lymphocytes developed. So here on, on the text, I have it red and I also red color coded on the figure. Now in terms of secondary lymphoid tissues, they are these yellow highlighted locations where immune response occurs, including our tonsil, lymph node, spleen, pious patch in the small intestine. So how are these secondary lymphoid tissues uh, connected in the body? So they're in fact connected by a network of vessels called the lymphatic uh, system, which transport lymph fluid. They are found throughout connective tissues of the body. Now here is a diagram to show you how it's interconnected with the circulations. Certainly this is a very simplified graph. Now notice that we have heart pumping out blood through the artery, these little yellow dots are referring to some of these uh, red blood cells. Now they would enter uh, the lymph node, it's connected to the arteries. What is coming out from the lymph node are actually two branches. Uh, certainly we have our vein which provide return blood supply to our heart. It also contain a branch called efferent lymphatic vessels which transport those uh, white cells back to the circulation. Now, lymphocytes, including both B cells and T cells, are primarily found in the lymph, but can circulate between the cardiovascular and the lymphatic compartments. Now, on the right-hand side here is a uh, diagram shows you what happens when there is a uh, invading pathogens. Now, pathogens encountered in the peripheral are transported to the nearest lymph node where the lymphocytes continuously uh, screen for uh, reactivity uh, such as the, that is described or that's illustrated in the um, lower right hand side box there. Okay, so this is why uh, when there is an infection, uh, some of the lymph nodes are swollen, particularly uh, in the neck or under your armpit. Now it is where actions uh, happen. Uh, in those lymph nodes, naive lymphocytes would arrive and get activated. Uh, after the uh, infection is cleared, the lymphocytes and lymph can return to the blood via lymphatic uh, bl uh, systems and th also the blood can return back to the heart with the venous supply. 
So now let's look at the action at the lymph node level. So we're looking we're looking at the figure where there is a uh, injury. Okay, uh, an innate immune response goes in there. We have macrophages. We can also have dendritic cells. Uh, you know, engulfing different pathogens and uh, further down going to present to the adaptive immune system. So the process here is that the lymph node can collect the lymph from infected tissues and through a vessel called afferent lymphatic vessel. Now afferent is just mean it is bringing uh, the lymph uh, fluid and as well as other uh, innate immune cells to uh, into a secondary lymph tissues here we are talking about the lymph node. Now once it transports all the uh, dendritic cells or other antigen presenting cells into the lymph node, it is where the bridging occurs. So T cells are going to be activated by antigen presenting cells, such as the um, dendritic cells. And after activations, well skipping a lot of the mechanism here, but eventually the B cells and T cells will start to proliferate and during that process, the lymph node is going to swell a little bit. Now, after uh, proliferations and differentiation activations, uh, antibodies and activated lymphocytes uh, can exit the lymph node via efferent lymphatic vessels and travel to infected tissues with more uh, specific uh, defense. So it is the activations of the uh, adaptive immune system. Now, notice that this process of uh, proliferations and uh, starting to produce specific antibodies it takes a couple days or maybe even weeks for the full effect to happen, uh, which we talked about in the last lecture. So what we've just looked at are examples of a peripheral infections where things that uh, get bring into the lymph node and the lymph node will supply the, uh, or some of those activated B cells, T cells and antibodies will leave the lymph node and travel to a distant site. Now what happened? Well, what if the infection is in the blood? Now here is the spleen that comes to uh, do the job. Now spleen is the only organ of the immune system where it's in direct contact with the blood supply. Now here are some of the structures or tissues of the spleen. Uh, this is not uh, going to be the focus here, but just notice that it has two major functions. Uh, first function is sort of serve as a large lymph node. Think of it, a large lymph node where it can monitor for blood-borne pathogens. Uh, where, what it happens or where it happens is during in those area we call it the white pulp. Uh, we have lymphocytes such as these T cells and B cells are uh, there doing their job. Another function for spleen is to uh, re remove okay old and damaged uh, white uh, red blood cells from the circulations. So uh, those are the red pulp. Okay, it's the other areas of the spleen. And the last secondary lymphoid tissue that I want to spend some time on is uh, an example of the mucosal lymphoid tissues. Now, what are the, where are the mucosals? Well, they're in the gut, okay, in the GI, and bronchial and also other mucosa. So we have a different system. We call it the gut associated lymphoid tissues or gold, bronchial associated lymphoid tissues, bolt or mucosa associated lymphoid tissues or mold. So they work very similarly. So we'll look at the gold or the gut associated lymphoid tissue as an example. So now the gut associated lymphoid tissues are also uh, including uh, different versions including the tonsil, the appendix, uh, uh, adenoids, and also pears patches or pears patch in the intestine. Now it is uh, a very interesting place. Now here we are looking at the figure of a pears patch. Now notice that it is drawn in a fashion that uh, it is facing the gut lumen. Now here we have the epitheliums or the little bit cilia that lines the uh, intestine, lines the small intestine. And in between those epithelial cells, there is a 
gap positions here. Now, in this little gap here, we have a cell type called the M cell. Now, M cell is called, uh, the full name is called microfold cell, microfold cells, uh, which is located in the epithelium covering of these uh, gold system. Now, it can transport the pathogens from the lumen to the lymphoid tissue below, and very similar to serve like a uh, large lymph node. So, the lymphoid tissues inside where we have uh, some of the common uh, innate and uh, as well as our adaptive immune cells as well. So inside that area, inside the lymph, lymphoid tissues, we have dendritic cells. Uh, it can uh, engulf pathogens and present antigen to our T cells. And also after T cell differentiation, they can also activate uh, B cells. Now in there also there is a uh, place called the germinal centers where uh, some of these uh, immature B cells, T cells are hosted and further developed and uh, into mature uh, lymphocytes. Now notice that it is connected to a efferent lymphatic uh, branch, so meaning that they can leave that area through this efferent lymphatic vessels. So this is the end of the second lecture. It may be shorter than what you expect. The reason for that is that we have less material to digest it, to easier to remember these material and build a solid foundation for our next lecture, which will be a deep dive into different innate immune cell receptors and their responses. So it's going to be a heavy lecture next time. So brace for the impact. Take care. Bye.